The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome to the show. Great stuff today. Coming up a little later, we're going to talk to a former Mormon who actually says that don't get this, uh, uh, this, you have to get this idea that Mitt Romney is going to in any way separate his religion from being the president if he is elected in November. That uh, Mormonism is basically going to dictate and be the primary driver behind everything Mitt Romney does if he's elected president. We'll talk to him later, Lewis, so don't get ahead of yourself now. I'm, I'm in control. Also, I got a letter today in the mail from Mitt Romney. I haven't opened it yet. I figure, I assume it's some kind of fundraising thing, but what list am I on that it makes sense to spend 43 cents or whatever it costs to send this to send me this letter? We'll open this up later. I have no idea what it is. I assume it's asking for money, but I'm curious what the context is. Yeah. We'll see what that is. It turns out that this leaked Mitt Romney video was arranged by Jimmy Carter's grandson, James Carter IV, not that it was filmed by James Carter IV, but that he arranged for its release. This is pretty interesting stuff. He persuaded the source who secretly taped Mitt Romney at this fundraiser to release the video to the, to the media and encouraged him to turn it over to a reporter over at uh, Mother Jones, who initially released the video widely. Kind of interesting that Jimmy Carter's grandson was, is tied up in this. I don't know anything about Jimmy Carter's grandson, but... Uh... I think it's safe to say uh, he's not voting for Mitt Romney. No, and it's also safe to say, and we know from experience and from just looking at the Internet over the last 24 hours, that lots of Republicans, any opportunity to do anything to try to bring to, to try to bring Mitt Romney back up, even the slightest bit they're doing. So now the thing is, Jimmy Carter was not a good president. Therefore, the fact that his grandson convinced someone else to release video of Mitt Romney, now we're four layers away, is somehow a negative reflection about Barack Obama. Is that the narrative now? It's five layers now. We're we're getting pretty deep here. It's incredible. I mean, the Republicans are desperate. Desperation is there, ladies and gentlemen. When you have to criticize Obama through Jimmy Carter, through his grandson through someone who taped. I mean, it's just incredible. When you, when you have to do a 10 p.m. press conference because of uh, leaked material, <laughs> yeah, that's desperation. You know you're in trouble when yeah. you show up at 1030 to talk about a YouTube video. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, a YouTube video and a major presidential candidate says, what the hell? It's 1030 at night. Let's do a press conference. Let's, hey, let's do it. Just a note on this uh, James Carter, the fourth guy. I saw him on Anderson Cooper last night and Anderson was asking him about the source of the video and he was like getting very uncomfortable and looking off camera to some person some aide or someone who was like kind of giving him the go ahead or the don't continue look uh and he would uh sort of say well you know i'm not very comfortable revealing that information and it was kind of like that interesting i mean it has to have been my question is was it someone who was officially in that room or was it someone who was unofficially in that room in other words in the videos and we'll get to another piece that's been leaked now you see wait staff. You see, there's clearly at least some people in that room who are not officially there as donors, so to speak. So I'm wondering if the video is from a official person or a non-official person. I'm willing to bet it's not official. You think so? Yeah. Well, you can see where it's placed. It's placed like on a table where there are like napkins and snacks. It looks like, and it's hidden under something. It was probably put there before anyone even got into the room by an employee. You think so? I don't know. I think uh, I- I'm not sure. I think it really could be either. Th- it is a good could, point, could though. Could go either way. That'd be my guess. Who would pay? I don't remember if this was a five thousand or fifty thousand dollar event or what it was. Who would pay that amount? And uh, I don't know. I guess it could be. It could be either way. I'm curious to see what comes of that. Let's get to another piece of that video. This is yet another piece of the leaked video, where Mitt Romney talks about Bain Capital profiting from Chinese slave labor. This is getting worse and worse. Of course, one of the issues Mitt Romney is trying to distance himself from, the idea that Bain Capital profited from the uh, outsourcing and offshoring of jobs to China, that they made money from Chinese companies that depend on outsourcing to earn their income. Well, now we have this video of Mitt Romney talking uh, in in very weird terms about Bain Capital and the involvement with this cheap labor over in China. Take a look at what he said. And uh, as we were walking to this facility, seeing them work, the number of hours they work per day, the pittance they earn, living in dormitories with, uh, with little bathrooms at the end of maybe 10, 10 rooms. And, they, and the rooms, they had 12 girls per, per room, three bunk beds uh, atop of each other. You've seen them. Oh, yeah. Them. yeah. And, and, and around this factory was a fence, a huge fence of barbed wire and guard towers. And, and we said, gosh, I can't believe that you 
you know, you keep these girls in. They said, no, no, no. This is to keep other people from coming in. Right. Because people want so badly to come work in this factory that we have to keep them out or they'll just come in here and start working and, and, and try and get compensated. So we, this is to keep people out. And they said, actually, at Chinese New Year, as the girls go home, sometimes they decide they've saved enough money and they don't come back to the factory. And he said, and so on, on the weekend after Chinese New Year, there'll be a line of people, hundreds long, outside the factory, hoping that some girls haven't come back and they can come to the factory. And, and so as we were experiencing this for the first time, we came to see a factory like this in China some years ago. The, the main partner I was with turned to me and said, you know, 95% of life is settled if you're born in America. This is, uh, this is an amazing land. And, and what we have is, is unique, and fortunately it is so special, we're sharing it with the world. There we go. So let's forget for a second about whether this stuff that Mitt Romney is saying is true. For a guy who wasn't in the business of, of, of using Chinese labor for profit, he certainly seems to know a lot of details about what was going on there, doesn't he? Well, he comes out and says that uh, they were directly involved with, with the workers at this factory. Absolutely. That's why he was there. It's very, very clear. So, yeah. again, I don't know if what he's saying is true. Some people, I'm guessing, will defend this video by saying, no, no, he was talking about the incredible worth, work ethic of those Chinese girls. Oh, right, he's talking about kids, ladies and gentlemen. He's talking about children who are so desperate to work that they're being employed by the companies that Mitt Romney is overseeing or buying or whatever. This is unbelievable video. Yeah, he does make a good point, though. He does say that, uh, you know, this is a great country and we do have, uh, you know, things like this aren't really, things like that aren't happening in our country and we're, we're fortunate to, uh, to have that. But to He's be honest, also supporting it, continuing to happen in China. It. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, I think possibly if he had his way, um, there would be factories like that in this country. Um, yeah. or, or he would just send all the jobs back to China. Who knows? Yeah. Why not? Send them all over there. Who knows? What do you think about this, Natan? I mean, I don't think a big enough deal is being made of this piece of the video. Maybe it's just yet, but I think this is huge. Yeah, I don't know. I was just thinking that, is it really, I mean, the whole idea of outsourcing jobs, this is obviously a part of that argument that, you know, this is a guy who outsourced jobs and now he's talking about, he's criticizing Obama for doing the same thing. I don't know. We should get into that at some point because economically it's it's really not that bad of a thing to outsource to have american companies outsourcing jobs to lower their costs for american consumers so i understand the hypocrisy of him accusing other people of that but you know at the same time i don't know if we should harp on him for for doing something that makes sense well it's you're making an interesting point which is that it makes sense in the sense that if you want to make products more affordable for americans who presumably you represent as the president or as whoever you are if you do reduce costs by allowing or, or, or giving the idea or supporting outsourcing of jobs to China, you reduce the cost, then things are cheaper for people here in the U.S. The thing is, I don't know that I would agree that in the long term, that's really what's better. Because in the long term, there's less people with jobs who will be able to afford those cheaper things. I don't know, but that's a different argument, Natan. Yeah, I mean, that's a complicated argument, uh, which we could have. But I think here the issue is just the hypocrisy of his rhetoric. Incredible. Let's go on to a couple of other clips. Barack Obama going on to the David Letterman show and addressing head on this question of Mitt Romney doesn't care about 47 percent of voters. This is kind of like shooting fish in a barrel, to be honest, because it was such a gaffe by Romney that all Obama has to do is show up and just say the obvious thing, which is I'm the president of everybody. He did that. Here's what he had to say to David Letterman last night. But they work hard and you don't meet anybody who uh, doesn't believe in the American dream and the fact that nobody is entitled to success, that you've got to work hard. And so I promise you, there, there are not a lot of people out there who think they're victims. There are not a lot of people who think that they're entitled to something. Uh, what I think the majority of people, Democrats and Republicans, believe is, is that uh, we've got some obligations to each other and there's nothing wrong with us giving each other a helping hand so that if there's a uh, that single mom's kid even after all the work she's done still can't afford to go to college for yeah. us to be able to give them you know uh, some help on a student loan so they they can end up being uh, you know curing the next uh, uh, disease or or making sure that uh, uh, they, you know, they're starting the next google i think that's a good investment for america and that Okay, so kind of the obvious thing to say, I, it's just kind of, you know, again, it's an easy PR appearance for him going on the Letterman show after Romney makes huge mistakes. But this stuff has to be adding up in some kind of aggregate way that's not going to help Romney as we get closer to the election. Every single one of these gaffes moves Romney down slightly, but it creates an opportunity for Obama to do an appearance and move himself up very slightly. It has to add up. 
Right. And we haven't really seen any gaffes from Obama, have we? No, we have not seen big gaffes. The, it's funny. I got a message somewhere on Facebook. Someone said something along the lines of, what about the, the Obama gaffe where he said you didn't build that? Like that, that, that wasn't a gaffe. It was taken out of context and it was actually true what he said. Nobody yeah. builds any business completely independent from any structures or support that the government puts into place. That's not a gaffe. It's just a statement of fact. Yeah. Just, it was just twisted. Very, very confusing. Interesting question that came up. Does it make sense that President Obama does not appear to have time to meet with Benjamin Netanyahu, but does have time to go on The Letterman Show? My thought on this is twofold. Well, on the one hand, you would think that a meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu is of much more importance than being on The David Letterman Show. On the other hand, you might say, listen, getting President Obama in office another four years instead of Romney is the most important thing. And going on The David Letterman Show is going to reach more of the people that can make that happen than he would by going and meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu. What's your thought, either of you guys? Uh, the meeting should should probably happen at some point. Um, at, I mean, I don't know if before the election really matters, but, I mean, it's an important meeting. Natan? Uh, it's really hard for me to know whether this is like a real piece of news that Obama refused to meet with Netanyahu or if it was just... Um, you know, they talk, they might, for all I know, they could talk every day on the phone and the meeting in person is purely symbolic. And they said, you know, let's just not get into this right now. P which or, would support or, the idea that publicly it makes much more sense for him to do one or the other. That's true. Um, but on the other hand, it could be that, uh, you know, Obama doesn't like Netanyahu, uh, which has been reported. <laughs> and maybe he just doesn't want to even deal with this before the election. I mean, is it a, do I think it should be a priority? Not really. To meet or to go on Letterman? To meet. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, it needs to happen at some point, but is it a huge, a huge priority right now? Well, Probably what if not. Israel's planning on bombing Iran tomorrow? Then that would make it a priority. Uh, I don't see how that meeting would change things. Okay. Let's talk very quickly before we break about Todd Akin. Remember Todd Akin who talked about legitimate rape and the body, the female body having the incredible ability to just shut the whole thing down in terms of a pregnancy. <laughs> it's funny. Now that it's been a couple of weeks since that incident, revisiting it, it sounds so absurd to even retell what that incident was. But that happened. And then Todd Akin was asked about the president and his statement on the Libyan the, uh, uh, ambassador being killed in Libya and that entire thing. And Todd Akin said, well, listen, Obama apologized because he didn't like America. He didn't like America. Interesting comment to hear from a, uh, from a congressman. Take a listen to this. President's fault. But first of all, apologizing to all people, uh, the, a lot of countries who are enemies and apologizing to them and everything. You know, if we did something wrong, that's one thing. But he's just apologizing because he didn't like America. I think that's the wrong thing to do. I think it's okay, there we go. Interesting comment from him. Completely um, uh, uh, clueless, has no idea what's going on. Uh, of, as we know, the statement that was released by the embassy, which he may be referring to, was not authorized by the White House. The president absolutely did not apologize for anything. The word apologize appears nowhere in the statement that the president made. If you're criticizing those who criticize the video, aren't you kind of defending the video? Forget about the merits of the video, which we talked about, but isn't that really what Todd Akin is doing here? And if people apologize for things that they don't like, explain the Republican Party apologizing for you, Todd Akin, after you made those insane comments about legitimate rape, it must mean that the Republican Party doesn't really like Todd Akin. Yeah. But the White House did request that Google take the video down. They did, absolutely. But that's, uh, but that's completely separate from a, an apology or anything. That's not an apology. That's more like uh, we're kind of afraid of this. It's kind of damage control, yeah. which I think is, we talked about it yesterday on the bonus show. Check out that bonus show. We had a long discussion about whether the right way to prevent these incidents is by having Google remove videos. I said it's not. Uh, check right. that out. On today's bonus show, we'll talk about Russian diamonds, an incredible amount of Russian diamonds have been uh, uh, now uh, revealed to exist. What will happen with the diamond market? Do we care? Do we care about the price of diamonds being affected? We'll talk about the best foxnews.com article ever. We'll also talk about whether conservative football player Tim Tebow will run for office. He had some things to say about that. I have some things to say about that. DavidPackman.com slash membership. The bonus show and all those other benefits. The David We're talking Pacman about pennies show. a day and it supports the show. Stay tuned. Com.
Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Welcome back to the show. You can support the show for free by doing all of your Amazon.com shopping through the black banner at davidpakman.com. You click it, you bookmark it, you use it when you shop, and you take 7% of your purchase away from Amazon, and you send it to The David Pakman Show. So keep that in mind. You can also become a David Pakman Show member, made possible in part by liberalbias.com. You may not realize this, but there's more and more evidence, Lewis, that penguins are liberal and are part of a conspiracy to make people scared of global warming. You can find out more about that at liberalbias.com. Will do. David, not David Pakman, David Blackman is today's new David Pakman Show member. It's a, he's probably the, the member with the closest name to mine, wouldn't you say? Yeah. You guys could do a, a separate show called like Pacman and Blackman. Pacman and Blackman. That would that would be pretty good. Or would it be Blackman and Pacman? Or it could be just David Squared. But that's been done, right? I don't know. Probably. And it'd be like Lewis Cubed. Let's not get carried away. Which is also how a lot of women describe their relationships with you. Cubed? <laughs> Whatever that means. Rush Limbaugh has come up with a ridiculous and irresponsible new conspiracy theory. Did you hear about this, Lewis? No, uh, no, not this one. This is, I, I try this, to tune him out. This is so incredible. Take a listen to this, his, his theory, which is that what happened is that Al-Qaeda might have given bin Laden up in order to make President Obama look better. I assume because Obama's a, a Kenyan Muslim, right? Sure. And that, uh, that they don't really need bin Laden anyway. He wasn't really doing much. Here's what Rush had to say. Listen to this. Just wild theory picking it off the wall. All of this <laughs> is a theory. What do the militant Islamists want more than anything in the world? Right. Israel gone is right. Mm -hmm. Even moderate Islamists want Israel gone. From Amud Ahmadinejad to Al-Qaeda to the Muslim Brotherhood. They all, you can find quotes from Palestinian leaders Hamas. Fatah, you name it, all of these factions of militant Islam. So give us the theory. Number one objective, no more Israel, and if they could bring it off, no more Jews. Of course. Okay, so what if... Now the bogus part. What if Ayman al-Zawahiri <laughs> and other al-Qaeda leaders gave up Osama bin Laden for the express purpose of making Os Obama look good, giving Obama stature, <laughs> political capital. Obama got Osama. I mean, really, do you think Al-Qaeda depends on Osama bin Laden anymore? It did. What was he doing there? He's, 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 he's in this, 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 they call it a mansion. It was a pigsty. Okay, so there's the theory from Rush Limbaugh. Now, to give you some kind of context here, Rush Limbaugh is the guy who said that government Obama's government was manipulating hurricane forecasts to make the Republicans look bad around the Republican National Convention. This is the guy who said that the Chicago teachers were striking to help Democrats. That's another idea that he had. Now he says clearly Al Qaeda said, let's give up Osama bin Laden to make Obama look good because that's what we want. Yeah. Um because Obama will allow the destruction of Israel. I mean, it's really, it's multi-tiered. You have it's, to it, Yeah, it's among the highest, the highest ranking of ridiculous uh, Obama theories. I think, you know, at first it sounds like he has a pretty good understanding of, of how militant Islam operates. Right. Uh, and then he says this, and if you have any idea, uh, you know, how they operate, they would never never consider anything like this. Well, it's good. That's part of a good conspiracy theory, which is you lay down a kind of basic layer of facts that are kind of just widely known, because then when someone starts from the beginning, they say, well, listen, he's kind of starting with accurate premises. Yeah. I, I should at least listen to what the conclusion is. It's a very typical of these conspiracy theories. Yeah. Here's another conspiracy theory. Premier Radio Networks, which distributes Rush Limbaugh's show and Sean Hannity's show, um, is owned by Clear Channel. Now, Clear Channel is owned by Bain Capital. So basically, Rush Limbaugh is working for Mitt Romney. How, what about that crazy conspiracy? Not nearly as far-fetched as, uh, <laughs> as this uh, Obama-Osama theory. Hey, Clint Eastwood was interviewed about that RNC speech where he talked to a chair, and it was rated the highest, the most liked part of the entire Republican National Convention was Clint Eastwood talking to an empty chair. He actually said... Anyone dumb enough to ask me to speak at a political convention gets whatever they get. This is unbelievable. Here's the interview from Extra with Clint Eastwood. I love this. 
if somebody's dumb enough to ask me to go to a political convention and say something, uh, either they're going to have to take what they get. <laughs> Who asked you? Point. Did Mitt ask you personally? Uh, yeah, I think uh, he, actually he had some of his, his people ask him. And I like him. I think he's a, a good guy. I Wait a minute. Mitt Romney did not pick up the phone and call you personally? No, but I met, it, met with him. Right. Uh, okay. And, ah, there uh, we go. Okay, so, well, that explains it. You know what? Honestly, um, if Clint Eastwood, Clint Eastwood said, by the way, he would do it all over again. He says, I never look backward. It's done and done. I probably would do it again. I wouldn't be afraid of it. This is incredible because um, it's kind of great. First, you destroy the Republican convention, and then you go out and insult them for inviting you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of brilliant in a way, isn't it? Well, I mean, there's there's some honesty here. I mean, he's, he's saying that he's not the ideal person to speak at a convention. <laughs> I'll say. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, good for him. He's doing a big part in bringing Romney down here. <laughs> I don't know about that. I mean, the, the speech was ridiculous. Come on. But it was funny. It was funny in a, in a you're laughing at him way, not you're laughing with him. That's There's a difference there. I don't know. I think it depends on who was watching. Here's something really interesting. There's a number of, of advisors to Mitt Romney that are working for Fox News, and Fox News isn't telling you that in most cases. This is great reporting from Media Matters. It's hard to differentiate a lot of the times Fox News contributors from members of the Romney campaign. I understand that. But sometimes they are actually Fox News contributors and members of the Mitt Romney campaign. There's four Fox News contributors that are surrogates or advisors for Mitt Romney's campaign. And in a lot of cases, Fox News doesn't tell you this. You want to hear about this, Lewis? Please. Otherwise, I can move on. Lay it on me. John Bolton. You know John Bolton. John Bolton is a I know Fox Michael News. Bolton. <laughs> uh, John Bolton is a Fox News contributor and a Romney advisor. His role with the Romney campaign is foreign policy advisor, according to MittRomney.com, according to the New York Times, etc. He is also a, a Fox News contributor paid Fox News contributor, and he was not introduced that way a number of times on Fox News. Uh, the re rebuttal was that, well, he's not paid by the campaign. He gives advice to a lot of different people, but we're not paying him. Okay, let's go to the next one. Elaine Chow. Elaine Chow is a Fox News contributor and a Romney national chair of Asian American and Pacific Islanders for Romney, according to MittRomney.com. Fox Business hosted Elaine Chow to analyze the Obama administration, didn't disclose that she's affiliated with the Romney campaign. That was on August 29th and on September 6th. Interesting. Let's keep going. Walid Faris. He's a Fox News analyst and a Romney advisor. His role with the Romney campaign, special advisor on foreign policy and national security advisory team, co-chair, Middle East and North Africa working group, according to Mitt Romney's own website. Well, he goes on Fox News. He's critical of how President Obama is handling foreign policy. He goes on Fox Business. His ties to the Romney campaign repeatedly not mentioned. And lastly, Pete Snyder, who is a Fox News contributor, and he is also a Romney surrogate at a number of campaign events, MittRomney.com, so on and so forth. During his first appearance as a Fox News contributor on August 8th, he was introduced as a Republican strategist and the newest Fox News contributor. No mention of his role as a Mitt Romney surrogate. Interesting. My big question from all this is not why is Fox News doing this. We know why Fox News is doing this. Question is, why would either Fox News or Mitt Romney hire John Bolton to do anything? <laughs> that, that's my real question I come away with. Yeah, I don't think either, either party here is too concerned about these affiliations. I think uh, they're just going to let it slide and try to make no mention of it if it comes up all over the place. Well, either party in terms the, of Ro the Romney or Fox, right. not either political party. Right, 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 yeah. This morning, I when I was leaving to come to the studio, I had this letter from Mitt Romney. I didn't open it yet. Let's just open it up and see what yeah. it is. I mean, I don't know what list I'm on that they would want to uh, send me stuff. Let's Maybe take it a just look says here. like F you or something like that. All right, let's take a look here. I've got a little thing here that says, I will stand with you, Mitt. And today... To help you get your message out to voters across America, I'm pleased to join your team as a major supporter. And I can check anything from uh, $2,500 down to, you know, whatever amount I want. There's that. Okay. Here's a letter from Mitt Romney. Dear David, over the last three plus years, we've seen hopes and dreams diminished by false promises and weak leadership. President Obama's first term has been a failure. More than 23 million Americans are struggling for work. President Obama's created millions of jobs. The median household income has dropped by $4,300.
it would drop by way more if you became president meant. New business startups are at the lowest level in 30 years. Our debt has skyrocketed. Interesting. Of course, President Obama has seen the smallest debt growth dating back to the Eisenhower administration. America needs strong leadership, blah, blah, blah. Please contribute the maximum $2,500. And we even have a Mitt Romney envelope here. Didn't even pay for the stamp, Lewis. You'd think he would at least give me the stamp if I'm donating 2500 Anyway, uh, you know what? If this was a postage paid, I would actually do what sometimes I do with, with uh, spam, which is I fold it up and put it in the envelope and actually send it back at their expense. Mm -hmm. Not going to do it. We'll just rip it up and then just toss it. There we there go. go. All right, let's take a break. Coming I'm not up next, that. a former Mormon who is very concerned about Mitt Romney being the next president of the U.S. Stay tuned for that. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. I'm joined by Sean McCraney. He's a former Latter-day Saint of 40 years. He's now a non-denominational Christian pastor. He's also host of Heart of the Matter. You can find out more at HOTM. Dot TV. So, Sean, I've got a whole bunch of questions for you that were sent in by our audience. But before we get to those, let's just kind of set the scene here. Former Mormon, explain how that happened, what that means. Give us the background. Uh, I was a returned LDS missionary, married in the Los Angeles temple, active elders quorum president, high priest, three children, very engaged in the church. And, but I did not know uh, my relationship to God. I didn't understand it, even though I knew Mormon doctrines really well. Long story short, 1997, I had a roadside experience that altered my, uh, my views of Mormonism. I came to know God in a different way and ultimately left Mormonism and uh, went to theology school and uh, became a pastor, read, read a book. And it turned into a television show in Salt Lake, moved from Southern California, and began hosting it. So it's interesting because after leaving the Mormon church, you moved to Salt Lake City, which is kind of, a lot of people might think that that's counterintuitive, don't you think? Yeah, except for Southern California has a very large LDS population. Most of the Western United States, there's a lot of LDS, so not so counterintuitive, maybe in the, in the East, but not in the West. Okay, so then let's talk more specifically. Um, how did your relationship to a lot of the people that were part of your life when you were in the LDS, uh, how, did that change? In other words, were you seen differently? What was the reaction from within the Mormon church when you chose to leave? Yeah, David, uh, Mormonism uh, uses totalistic methodologies in how they teach their people, meaning the LDS church is the only true church on the face of the earth. Uh, they are the only ones with priesthood, authority from God, etc., etc. And when you leave, you either conform or you're cast out. And so when I left, I literally was uh, ostracized uh, by uh, family, friends. Basically, they don't come out against you. A couple people have. They essentially act like you're dead. So there's people in your own family, you're saying, that are no longer in touch with you because of your choice to leave. Absolutely. Okay, so... When you see what's going on now with Mitt Romney and this presidential election, do you have any insights? Do you have any thoughts about what Mitt Romney's religion means for his potential presidency that the average person who's not as familiar with the Mormon church just wouldn't know? Absolutely, David. Uh, and, and, and it's so amazing to me especially how the evangelical, so-called evangelical church has suddenly held him up as a hero. Uh, you know, they've turned a blind eye to what they once really understood, and that is, uh, they used to compare a Mormon running for president to a Catholic, like John F. Kennedy. Well, you know, it's the same thing. It is not the same thing. Mitt Romney, first and foremost, entered into an LDS temple, he raised his arm to the square, which to him means before God, angels, and everybody who saw him. And he swore allegiance to the LDS church and building it up 
first and foremost of everything he does in his life or will do in his life. It literally says what you have done or what you will do will go toward building up the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, the, the religion began, began with theocratic um, ideas. Joseph Smith, the founder, ran for president of the United States. Brigham Young controlled Utah Territory in a theocratic sense. They have long sought for theocratic control, and they will get it. His uh, Romney's uh, allegiance will be to the prophet of the LDS Church and to his faith far before it will be to the presidency, unless he's a liar. And then he's lying to God, angels, and witnesses, and he's giving his allegiance to the country. It's one way or another the man will be proven deceptive. So let's think then about specifically what would that mean in terms of for the average person who's maybe not that familiar familiar with Mormon doctrine, how will this allegiance, this primary allegiance to the Mormon church be represented day to day in terms of either policy or how will the average person see this if Mitt Romney is the president? They're too smart and I don't think they will see it, uh, but it, it, will, it will happen subtly. First of all, Mormonism will gain uh, uh, inroads and roots internationally. It will proliferate internationally where the uh, tenets of the faith are not as well known as they are in the United States. That will give them more power. Today they bring in, this isn't uh, known by most people, the Mormon Church brings in about $16 million a day in income. They are probably the most cash rich church on the face of this earth. Now, to some people that would say, well, they know how to manage money. Let's put a man in office. But they don't realize the fallout. That Mormonism and Mormon industry, Mormon-led people will begin to get contracts like they've done in Utah for years. There's a buddy system that isn't seen. It's through their priesthood, and uh, it will have an effect in the long term. Now, to non-Christian people, they probably don't care. But from my perspective, it's heinous. Let's talk about a couple of other things that have kind of come up as controversies that, that a lot of people want to want to know about. Um, one question that I got from Dal was, have you ever been involved or personally seen this retroactive or posthumous baptism into the Mormon church, which has been so controversial, allegedly involved also pr the President Obama's mother who passed away? What do you know about that? Uh, it's it's uh, endemic to Mormonism. They believe in saving their dead by uh, going and doing genealogy, baptizing people who have passed on vicariously through somebody who stands in their place. They, it, it's part of their total control, and so they go, they, they've had no care for who they've uh, posthumously baptized or done temple rites for. They do it for everybody because they honestly believe that they will, uh, they have the thing that needs to convert the entire world. Uh, additionally, David, uh, Romney's place here is, is very much being hailed in closed circles of Mormonism as a fulfillment of a prophecy that has long existed. They call it the White Horse prom, uh, Prophecy. The Constitution states will hang by a thread, and the Mormon elders will come in and save it. They are viewing Romney uh, coming and, uh, and taking office as a fulfillment of that long-discussed uh, prophecy. Okay, and then last thing, there's a couple of these Mormons for Obama groups or de Mormon Democrat groups that are getting a little bit of news. You see them on Facebook, you see them here and there. On the whole, is there going to be any significant Mormon population that is not going to support yeah. Mitt Romney? No. No. Just no. That's not it. It's just mostly going to go for Romney. No. No, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a certain... I mean, like any religious uh, uh, institution, there's little di different segments and sects within Mormonism. There's some intellectual groups. There's some uh, groups that really want homosexuality to be embraced by the church. Some of those groups might uh, vote for Obama, but they might represent one half of one percent of the LDS uh, population, active population. All right. We've been speaking with Sean McCraney, former uh, Latter-day Saint of 40 years, now a non-denominational Christian pastor. You can check out his television show, Heart of the Matter, at hotm.tv. Sean, really a pleasure to speak with you. Much appreciate you taking the time, and we'll absolutely be tuning into your show. Thanks, David. God bless. Take care. Okay, thank you. We'll take a break. We'll be back with plenty more after this. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.
The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Please support the show through a David Pakman Show membership at davidpakman.com slash membership. Parents in El Paso, Texas say they are shocked to find out that a teacher at Huey Elementary asked their children to depict airplanes flying into buildings, explosions, and people jumping to their deaths to remember the attacks of September 11th, 2001. This was just last week, Lewis, during the September 11th, 11-year uh, anniversary. Uh, the daughter of Ivy Gramillion recalled, we had to draw the boom cloud, the planes hitting, and people jumping out of the windows. The girls' drawings show people jumping out of burning buildings, yelling, help, and I love you. Hmm. In another picture, the terrorist pilots are laughing as they fly planes into the World Trade Center. There's something that, this is something that kids should get in trouble for drawing. That's people being murdered, committing suicide. According to uh, this mom, Ms. Gramillion, um, the, teachers taught, the teacher also taught students that the Afghans did this because they hate all of us and want to kill us all. Some kids were so distraught the next day they didn't want to go to school. Some kids thought that this is the type of thing that happens every 9-11. What do you think about this? You know, on one hand, my reaction was based on just the assignment. Then I heard that the teacher was also teaching that Afghans did this because they hate and want to kill all of us. That kind of pushed it over the edge. Uh, pretty irresponsible. Clearly just uh, an attempt at brainwashing here. Uh, even if you have these thoughts, you can't bring that into the classroom. It's, it's ridiculous. Do you think this is totally disconnected from the fact that Texas is a state that has rewritten American history in its textbooks? Um, uh, rewritten the role of slavery in relation to the Civil War and basically made it seem like Joe McCarthy was a, just a nice guy. They want to ban the teaching of critical thinking skills. Is that connected to this particular teacher or is this a so-called lone wolf, as we might say? I, I can't say that it's, it's part of the whole Texas uh, debacle. I can't say that with certitude. Interesting. Am I shocked that Texas is where this happened? No. Ah, okay. Well, there we go. Send me your thoughts on this one. Uh, I talked yesterday about my time at Circuit City working in retail, and I told a couple stories and asked people to send stories in. I got so many funny stories, Lewis. You're not going to believe this. I want to read a few. Uh, Gary wrote to me and said, here's my story. I was working at a Macy's in Houston. My coworker was a funny Colombian guy. I was passing the counter, and Bernardo was with a customer returning an Armani dress shirt. I noticed she had rammed the shirt in the bag, and it was very, very wrinkled. I must have made a face because Bernard Bernardo got a gleam in his eye and continued working with the lady. He processed the return, handed the woman her cash. Without missing a beat, he pulled out the trash can from behind the counter and threw the shirt away <laughs> and told the woman to have a nice day. You should have seen the look on her face <laughs> after she left. I took the shirt to the tailor shop, pressed it up, and put it back on the sales floor. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good one. Yeah. You know, this happened to me. I went to a hardware store and bought a bulb or some kind of piece for my toilet or something. It wasn't the right thing. The return policy was very clearly, you can't return air conditioner filters. Otherwise, you can return anything. And I told the guy, I want to return this. He's like, well, but we can't resell this. You've opened it. And I said, well, but the return policy is written right here. It doesn't say anything about not being able to return this once it's opened. And he just grabs it, gives me the money, tosses it in the trash, and th says, thanks, have a nice day. Giving me the same impression that, you know, I've ruined the business. I've returned something they can't resell. Uh, fix the return policy, then. It's not my fault. Yeah. Okay, Chris works at a gro he worked at a grocery store deli. He was slicing up meat. A customer asked for a type of meat that wasn't in the display case. I told him I'd check the back and went and found some. I brought it out. Held it over the trash can as usual to open the bag so the juices run into the trash. The entire thing flew out of the bag and into the trash. Acting like nothing happened and I hadn't even gone into the back room yet, I told the customer, it doesn't appear we have one in the display and I'll, that I'll check the back. The customer gave him a weird look. He went back there, grabbed another one, opened it, sliced the meat, and gave it to the guy. The entire time the guy was acting very bizarre, like he wasn't sure if he was completely crazy or not. After the guy left, I took the meat out of the trash, rinsed it off. Interesting. These are some good stories, Lewis, I must say. Yeah, those two good ones so far. I think I have time for one more here. Uh, okay, here, a lot of Best Buy stories. Brig was working at Best Buy Geek Squad in 2006. Nightmare customer, outrageous guy complaining about everything. 60-year-old man. Comes in, he wants his hard drive backed up. So he's standing at the counter. We have his laptop open, going through what folders he wants backed up. As one of my guys is searching the whole hard drive, he finds loads of porn pictures, videos, every imaginable type of porn, straight porn, gay porn, everything. 
the guy doesn't realize that that's what they're looking at because even though he's three feet away, he's facing the other way as the laptop. Then they pull up pictures of the guy himself doing all sorts of strange sexual stuff. <laughs> when we see that, our expression changes and now he can tell exactly what we're looking at without even seeing the screen. He becomes cooperative and polite all of a sudden, drops the attitude, we back everything up, free of charge, send him on his way, never hear from the guy again. <laughs> I love these. You wow. got to keep these coming. Um, let's do one more quick one here. This is Ken, who is Asian, and this is relevant to the story. Back in 99, I worked at a Toys R Us. Customer comes in to buy a bike with a check. I ask for his ID. Says he doesn't have one. I tell him I can't accept a check without an ID. He proceeds to get angry, starts cursing and saying he doesn't have any other form of payment, going off on me. Says I'm a racist because he's black and he doesn't want to take checks from black people and he calls me a chink. Being a smart ass, I told him, sir, I'd be more offended if you called me names correctly. Chinks are Chinese. I'm Vietnamese. And I guess the guy went completely crazy after that and ended up leaving. And who knows what, what, where he took that check. Nice. Yeah. You must have good ones from your time at, at working at a grocery store. Um, not really. You oh, know, okay. I, I didn't, I didn't interact with nearly as many people as say the cashiers do. I mean, a lot of it was just running fruit out and vegetables out, stacking it up, you go back, you repeat. I mean, it really wasn't, uh, I, none, nothing's sticking out, but I'll think about it. Think about some. Keep these coming. I have plenty more, so we'll tell a couple of these on another show. A couple of voicemails to get to. 2192 David P is our voicemail line. You can call 24 hours a day. Here's another voicemail about Lewis not voting. Let's take a listen. Hi, guys. Nina A here again. Um, this is for Lewis. Lewis, I totally understand why you're dissatisfied with the system, with the two-party system, and with the financial state of our politics. But I'm curious to know what you think not voting will actually do. Yesterday you said that you're probably doing more for politics by producing the show. And that's probably partially true, though I wonder how many, how much of your audience are left-leaning, politically interested people in the first place. So I guess we could argue that point. I'm just wondering, have you ever thought about um, voting for third-party candidates? Or okay, so that's, that's a good point. What do you think will improve by you not voting? Um, I haven't really thought about that. Ah. I haven't really thought about that. And so Nina brings up a good point. It is a good point. I mean, if someone, if someone who is uh, just unaware of how things operate votes but doesn't really pay attention to things, ask me about it, I say, I don't vote. And they'll say, well, why? Maybe I can tell them. Maybe... Maybe my not voting uh, will be, what's the word? The catalyst for change? But you don't believe that. A little far-fetched. Yeah, I mean, it's nonsense. I'm just pissed off about everything, so I don't vote. Um, have I thought about voting for a third-party candidate? No. Unfortunately, our system is set up so that they have no shot of winning. Especially and if people don't think they can win and don't vote, vote. I mean, you vote for a third-party candidate. Your vote is completely irrelevant. Natan, you want to comment? Uh, well, you just said it, Dave. If uh, if everyone thinks like Lewis, then third parties will never have an impact. I mean, obviously, in the 92 and possibly in the 96 general elections, uh, third, the third party candidate, Ross Perot, uh, got a lot of the vote and certainly affected the election. No question uh, about it. However, you could argue that the people who voted for him didn't get anything out of it, really. All right. One more voicemail here. Let's take a listen. Hey, uh, hey, David, I uh, just wanted to ask you guys, well, I'll read you guys a question about uh, Mitt Romney and how he, with how everything's unfolded since he began running for president, when it begged the question, you know, don't you think maybe they should have chose somebody else after everything's unfolded? I mean, with the 47% video that just came out, and it seems like every day you can't go without saying something stupid. Yeah, you know, I think that if the 47% video had come out in the middle of the Republican primary race instead of after he had already been officially nominated at the Republican National Convention, it could have had a pretty big impact because other Republicans would also have been very critical of him. It absolutely could have changed the direction of things. Do Republicans now wish that they would pick someone else? Maybe so. That's a, that's a really good question. Lewis, am I rapping or are we going? We're done. We're done. We'll see you tomorrow. Show at davidpacman.com.